everybody. Welcome back to Breakfast with Bob. We're here at the 2021 USA Cycling Paracycling Road National Championships hosted by CAF. Partnership between CAF USA Cycling and U.S. Paralympics. Paralympic gold and silver medalist, 37-time Xterra champion, one-time Xterra world champion, Jamie Whitmore joins us. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. You're one of those people who's basically had two sporting lives, right? Do you look at it, look at it that way? I, I have. It was the you know pro pre-cancer career as a mountain biker and Xterra athlete and the post-cancer para career, Yes. Um, basically cycling on the road. And you just, you're coming off the Paralympic trials in Minnesota. And the, the deal is, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of spots, right, for swimming and for cycling. Right, for anything. I think, I think the most difficult thing is that um, parasports have always been super small in the past. Like, we just haven't had a lot of, of participants or, right. or people doing it. And now we do. We're, we're pushing for that growth, but then we're not expanding to be able to um, take on that growth. Right. Well, and if you think about it, if you're going to the trials and you know there's very little chance of getting a spot, why go to the trials? I know. It's a frustrating thing. Like, literally the women, I think it was about a five days before, found out that... Um, I want to say four of our slots were ring fenced, which means we have to take somebody in that category. And it's something that in the Olympic world they don't do. Right. And I think most sports don't do that. But it's a special thing in cycling, and it was to really open the doors for people with um, more severe disabilities mm -hmm. to make sure that those categories were represented. Okay. And so I understand it, but now... All of those categories are represented, so we need to get rid of ring fencing. And so essentially, by the time I was already there, I found out that we had only two open slots. So but they don't tell you that ahead of time. So no. think about how many people go there knowing that, okay, there's two open spots. And, I, and that's not just in your category. That's for all of paracycling. Correct. That is every single female. And with the men, I think it was essentially like three open slots. Right. And so, no, you don't find any of this out. You go there thinking, hey, there's six open slots because that's all we earned. And I mean, that was another issue. We just didn't earn our max slots. Going into Rio, we had seven slots secured. Going into this, we only had six. And on the men's side, we had only secured eight, whereas going into Rio, we had secured nine. And there's other countries that are getting more spots. Absolutely. I mean, it, the sport is just growing around the world. Mm -hmm. And then that begs, that's that's the thing, is we're not allowing that growth. I mean, last time I checked, I think we allow 80 women into the Paralympics for cycling. Mm -hmm. Well, there's 13 categories. So even if you filled 10 into each category, that's 130 women. We're not sending 130 women. So what's the, what's the problem? We're not asking for more medals. We're just asking for more people to more be able to participate. More representation. Exactly right. So take me back. Uh, when you were growing up, that was being an athlete always at the top of mind for you? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I had dreams of being like in the NFL and things like that. <laughs> because, you know, I didn't know the difference between men and women. I was like, I like football. I want to be a football player. Um, so it was just about finding that sport that I wanted to do. So that's what I set out to do. Or, or finding that sport that I'd be good at. <laughs> yeah, right. And so when you're watching the Olympics on TV, the, so many swimming events, you're thinking... I'll do that. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I grew up swimming, so that was what I wanted to do. And then for whatever reason, I got into running. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I walked away from swimming and tried doing team sports, which was like softball and volleyball. And those weren't. They didn't work for no, you. No, they just didn't. It was too much pressure. And I didn't like being mad at other people for something that wasn't their fault. Uh, you, you didn't like counting <laughs> on other people. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. okay, that's the truth. I liked relying heavily on myself. Because which is great. Then, yeah, because then if it's like if I failed, then it would then then it's on me, and right. I can go and reevaluate. But when you're working with a team, I mean, people who play team sports, it's incredible. It's incredible to like rely on each other and encourage each other. Um, I was just afraid. I didn't. I don't want that pressure. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. So, so, when did you get to the point with swimming where you thought, because the goal obviously is you want to go to Olympics, where you thought, okay, this is not going to happen in the pool. You know, I think it just had to do with the coach when I was growing up. He was like really mean and always yelled, and I just 
just was like, I don't I, need that. I didn't want to be, I know I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to always be yelled at. And, and the practices were like two times a day. And I was just like, I'm swimming my butt off and I'm still getting yelled at. Well, you're also a social person. Your head <laughs> down in the water is probably not the best thing for Jamie Whitmore. <laughs> right? Maybe that was more it. I, I couldn't uh, talk to anyone. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So then go cross country and track. Right. You can talk to people. I, yeah. I mean, I loved, I loved the aspect of running in, and I started in junior high. I started running the mile and then went, went into high school and discovered that there was cross country. Mm -hmm. And I did. I loved everything about that of relying on myself, um, but being able to encourage teammates because you still have a team and, right. and you encourage them in their races. And then I could focus on me trying to be the best that I could be. Okay. And then you ran through high school and college? I did. I earned a scholarship to Cal State Northridge. And I, I mean, I loved it. It was crazy because we went from like my longest run being two miles mm -hmm. to now competing on the track for 6.2 miles, which is a whole lot of laps around a track. And I felt like my swimming was like catching up to me, <laughs> that yeah. repetitive back and forth in the pool. So when you graduate college at that point, you, I'm guessing you weren't quite ready for the, okay, I'm putting sport behind me. I'm going to go find a real job and, and do that. Heck no. I tried. I really did. After I graduated, I had interviews set up to be like a private investigator. I had done internship for the missing persons department or, wow. you, you know, for sheriffs. And I was like, you know, maybe I should look into U.S. Marshal. Like I, w I was ready, but sport was just still calling me back back and and I had always wanted to do a triathlon so yeah. you know then Barb Lindquist came on TV and was doing an interview and talking about how and she was a great swimmer and talking about how the the run was really hard um, that, that she was getting really strong on the bike because this was in her earlier career right and I just thought oh, man I should give that a try <laughs> right here she was an Olympic <laughs> swimmer transitioning to triathlon Correct. Yeah. So I and thought you're like, well, I swam, exactly. I ran. Exactly. How, how, how tough could it be to ride a bike? <laughs> Pretty much where I was at in okay. that moment. So when you did your first triathlon, was it a sort of light bulb moment? Like I dig this. You know, my first event actually ended up being a duathlon. Okay. So I think that's like what legit sold the deal because I ran, I biked, and I ran. So you didn't have to deal. With so the I didn't even stuff. have to swim, and I just like I flew, and it felt amazing. So then I was like, I can do triathlon, and then I went to Wildflower. <laughs> <laughs> Lake San Antonio. Yeah. And it was a really tough course, but I, I believe I made the podium there. I, I don't know if I was like third or fourth yeah. or fifth, but I, I was there and I just thought, oh, this is it. I'm sold. <laughs> and, and so you, at that point, uh, triathlon's an Olympic sport. Were you thinking, okay, I, I can do the Olympics with this? Absolutely. I mean, I was thinking whatever whatever I can do to get there. Like, right. let me just figure out. Um, but then I also noticed that for it to be an Olympic sport, you, you basically like the swim was the most important and then the run was pretty important and you draft on the bike, which so, didn't suit you at all oh, because you're, you're a cyclist. Exactly. I'm a cyclist and a runner. So I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to bump up my swimming to be Olympic swimming. And you already decided you didn't like that swim back and forth all day long. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, so now, and of course you could go, and do Iron Man, but that's that's a lot. It's a long day. Oh, that's a very long and day. And that makes the swims even longer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it was mountain bike next then. So at the same time that I was kind of dabbling in triathlon, yeah, I was introduced to mountain biking, and I hated it in the beginning. Really? Oh, it was so hard. I crashed. I had to walk sections, and like my whole mindset was, no, you need to be on the bike. Like I shouldn't be walking. But I was encouraged to just keep trying, and then I started making a game out of. You know, if you have to put a foot down through a section or if you crash through a section, there would be points that were set up to that. And walking cost me the most points. Ooh. So I stopped walking. <laughs> and this is your own game. Oh, yeah. yeah it was totally my own yeah. made up thing based off of how BM or not BMX um, that trials riding. Right. Where your you points where you, if, you, yeah, you lose, if you put your foot down. Yeah, exactly. Actually, yeah, it's yeah. all about, you know, getting through the on course. the bike. Yeah. Exactly. So I was like, hey, I'm going to do that. And so, man, I would be so determined to crash through or not crash or not walk because they were the most points of just putting a foot down. And pretty soon, like I just started really excelling in mountain biking, especially through technical sections because I didn't like losing. And I had good friends and training partners that joined in on the game and I never wanted them to win. <laughs> I see. A, I see a pattern. So 
uh, you're doing mountain biking, and mountain biking becomes an Olympic sport in, in 1996. Mm-hmm. And was that the next thought that, hey, well, I can go in that sport? Yeah, you know, so I thought about that, and then I met Ned Overin at, at an Terra race in Tahoe, which wasn't far from my house, because I still love triathlon. Right. Like, I loved just doing triathlon. Maybe I'd never be a pro at it. Right. And so... Um, and, and so I was like, Hey, and I'd already gone pro in mountain biking at this point. Like I was dead set on like, I'm going yep. this, this route. And Ned kind of said, Hey, <laughs> Xterra is where it's at. It's like, you can, you can make a living at this. You, you seem to be pretty good. You really should focus wow. on Xterra. <laughs> and you did. I did. And had immediate success. I did. Um, I want to say, so in that race, it was real tricky because I was still an amateur mm-hmm. as a triathlete, but I was a pro as a mountain biker. So they let me in. But because my license as a triathlete was an amateur, I wasn't supposed to be okay. there because right. I didn't earn points to go there. So I was second place. I was legit second place. And so I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm doing this. I'm going pro now. Right. So I went pro in and I'd earned all my points as a triathlete anyways on the road. So I went pro as a triathlete, showed up to Maui, but I ended up having a crash in that race, but still finishing like in sixth place. (laughs) <laughs> so at the time, a woman named Melanie McQuaid, is, I'm not sure if she was a dominant person at she that point. She wasn't yet. Right? No. no, it was Anka Erlang. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so you guys were both sort of moving up at the same Correct. time, which probably led to a little bit of conflict, the fact that both of you wanted that crown. It did. I think definitely come the next year, 2001, uh, two, 2002, I went out to this tiny island called Saipan. Yes. And raced there and smoked the reigning world champion by like 26 minutes. And I had beat second place by 11 minutes. And it was a course that was right up my alley. So much climbing, like wet technical stuff. The run was through this jungle and you had to go through caves. And I mean, it was amazing. And the swim, I mean, I still was, I, I survived the swim. Right, right. But it was one of those where I was so ready to hit the U.S. circuit. And then the next race was Richmond, Virginia. And that's where you went against Mel? Yeah, and that was my first time against Melanie. And here's the funny part. My seat post broke because I had been racing in Norba. I did a mountain bike race in Snowshoe, West Virginia, and then drove from there to do the Xterra. And my seat post, I had been involved in a crash, had a, like a little dimple in mm-hmm. it. So when I fell off the bridge because I didn't get a pre-ride Richmond, um, it broke my seat post and I couldn't keep racing because there were these jagged oh, parts in Jesus. there. So technically my first race to really make my debut on us soil, like it was terrible. Yeah. I did, I DNF'd yeah. and it was my first DNF in my whole life. And I was devastated. So then I was really like, I'm coming on with a vengeance. And the next race was Keystone, Colorado, total altitude. Like you start at 6,000 feet That's and you climb you. to 11,000 feet. It's all uphill. And then it's all downhill on a super technical, like, downhill course oh it was right up my alley i was like i'm gonna rock this and i did <laughs> <laughs> when did it get the point because there was a point when we were covering xterra races where i mean back in the day in mountain biking you had ned against ned over and against john tomac and in yeah. triathlon we had mark allen against, paul, against dave scott and paul newby frazier against aaron baker but rivalries make a sport better they do. When did the rivalry with you and Melanie, was it just sort of grow over time? Or was there a moment where the two of you were like, okay, she's into my way? <laughs> I, I, think it was, I think it was pretty instant because, because after Keystone, she, we were tied for first. Mm. So then we went to um, Half Moon Bay and I had raced in Ver, um, like Vermont and, and left after that. And flew all the way to Half Moon Bay. Once again, didn't really get to pre-ride or anything. And I want to say, I think she won there, but it didn't matter because you have to throw one race out. Yes. So then we went into the USA Championships 100% tied. In Tahoe. Whoever, yeah, trail. Whoever wins, like wins. And I think I spent like a month there. I spent all summer training on that course because I knew ultimately this was the USA Championships. And then I, and then I won. And I took the U.S. title. And it was like that almost every single year. We would How many be, of those did you win? Like six, six seven? Six, six okay. yeah. One year I got the infamous flume, the flume nail in my tire, and I finished in like fifth place or something. Yeah. So I still won the U.S. Series or U.S. Um, championship, but I didn't, I, I think, or maybe I still did win the U.S. championship as well. Um, I don't really remember, but I know it cost me that race, and yeah. it was the first time I didn't win. Uh, but then Maui was sort of where Melanie 
seemed to oh, shine. Oh, yeah. She shined way more on Maui. Was it the heat, do you think? No, I think it was, I honestly, I don't, I honestly don't know because like that course, I, the course is basically, it's just open right? and you're, and you're riding down lava rock. I think she always had a st- stronger swim mm, and yes. then, and so she was always ahead of me and no matter what I did, I couldn't catch back up. I think mm. we were kind of equally matched on that and she, and oftentimes she would be a little bit stronger. And then that run, I just stunk in that run. <laughs> I just don't wasn't know good for why. You. No, I mean, running across the beach a sandy beach yeah it was just not my style um so i think it just i think it favored her because she was more of a power rider and a power runner and um tahoe was more finesse okay more uh, you know Uh, very technical right right more endurance and so yeah definitely more technical you needed more of an endurance fitness and it wasn't so much like that power rider style so when did you get to the point where you knew something was wrong with your body but the doctors weren't quite getting it so it started in in 2007 at worlds but i didn't know it in that moment it was about a month after that that um like my leg was still having issues like it was just there's this weird tingling pain in there and every time i tried to run it hurt like it was a significant pain and by january of 2008 that pain was keeping me up at night and so I think at first doctors were just like over usage injury. No, you have bursitis. You, they, they were just like not really looking into mm-hmm. it because I was seemingly healthy. Right. And then the other problem was every time I went and got a scan, they kept missing this large mass that was in my tiny body. <laughs> How the hell did they miss that? I mean, it's the size of what? Like a grapefruit? Oh, it was a grapefruit. It was absolutely the size of a grapefruit. And I'm 115 pounds and 5'5". Five five. Yeah. So... Honestly, I don't know, but you know, I mean, I don't know imaging, but they seem to miss it. And it just, they just kept sending me down. They kept saying different things, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, then it got to be, oh, we think you have an ovarian cyst. We think you have a neurological issue in your brain. We think you have a ruptured disc. uh, We think you have a low pain threshold. That's why it's hurting (laughs) you. Somebody who climbs up the flume trail. Right. That's how I felt. I felt that they thought I was in there seeking drugs. And I'm like, no, no, no. You saw it comes to my door. No, I don't want drugs. I want you to fix this. What was the lowest point for you during all that? Um, When you go without sleep, for a period of time, man. Yet people don't under, don't understand how that just screws with you. Oh yeah, no. It, it, I was I couldn't I couldn't I didn't know where I was a lot of times. I kept holding out hope that I would return to racing. Mm-hmm. I think that's the only thing that kept me going. Um, but yeah, my dad said I would be I would wake up in the middle of the night screaming in pain every time he had to drive me to the hospital to see another doctor. Like I would scream the whole way. Like he he was scared. He was fearful. Wow. And so then when did they tell you, okay, there's a tumor wrapped around your sciatic nerve and we're going to have to cut. Now, when they, they, they have to go and cut it, did they know that you'd have drop foot after that? No, they actually only knew that I had a spindle cell sarcoma. Okay. So with that information, they knew that it was attached to some sort of soft tissue or bone mm-hmm. because that's where sarcomas attach. Your organs, you know, like anything that's kind of important is right. what they attach to your muscle. It could be a vein. Um, it could be a nerve. Right. But it's very rare for it to be a nerve. So they didn't suspect that. And I think they were a little worried it could have been in my bone, that it could have been osteosarcoma. Sure. But it was just so huge and I was so tiny. They wouldn't know anything until they cut me open. And then when they, they cut you open and then they had to do what they had to do. And yeah. then who told you when you woke up? Um, you know, no one did. My, my ex-husband told everybody to like not tell me anything and let me figure it out for myself. And um, at the time, I was really upset <laughs> when I found this news out. But I think it had more to do with um, ha- allowing a person to figure out to find their way instead of being told like what was wrong with them. And what you can and can't do. Correct. They're basically saying, okay, you, you came to realize what's going on. I can't really walk. I don't think this is getting better. I better figure something else out. Right. And then it was a friend that was like sitting in there that said, oh, you'll, you have drop foot. You'll just wear a brace. And I was like, drop what? <laughs> oh, my God. Right. And then and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, oh, this, this is permanent. You're a professional athlete. Right, right. Making a living doing this. And now all of a sudden it's gone. Right. Yeah, and, it, it, and it literally was him sitting there that I, that I would say, I don't say, I wouldn't say I hit a low point, but reality like hit me like a ton of bricks. Right. And I just was like, what do I do now? And it was interesting because you came to a number of Xterra races and you had a walker and you were doing the race. And I'm just like, this isn't going to last. <laughs> you know, Jamie's too competitive to go out there and just have people go. It's great just to have you here. 
but if you can't run and be competitive, you're not Jamie. Right. You, you know, you were instrumental because after that guy came in, that friend of mine who was a physician's assistant, after he, it probably was like a day or two, you had then called my ex and said, hey, I want you to remind Jamie there's always the Paralympics. And it, and it was like that trigger that I was like, I want to go to the Paralympics. Like if I can't go to the Olympics, like that's the next best thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to be the best challenged athlete that there is. And so, and I knew about the challenged athletes already. And I had friends, you know, oh, Willie. Oh, because we're all Willie's there. And absolutely. You, you, we doing, Andy May. Yeah. I'd seen Rudy would show up to do a relay. Yeah. Like, so it was, it was in, like I knew about it. And I was just like, I'm going to come back and be the best challenged athlete. And <laughs> so 2012 is London. Was there a chance to make it to London? No. Or was it was just a little too new. Looking back now, like, yeah, had I gotten into the scene maybe a year, I could have I could have gotten a slot. I could have helped earn more points. Right. But, yeah, going into that trials, and I did do it, I literally just hadn't been on the bike long enough, and there was only one slot open. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which I didn't know showing up. <laughs> so then here's this you know little girl who always wanted to be on, in the Olympics and always wanted to be at a podium, and now – that dream resurfaces Absolutely. and you've got Rio sitting out there. When did you get the feel that, okay, I, I think I can actually get to Rio and be on the Paralympic team. It was watching the London Paralympics. They had, it was being in London and having them treat so many of their athletes, like basically like able-bodied athletes. They had good coverage. I, I had just met a handful of people that had been announced to the team. So I got to watch all of them and I thought like, this is incredible. I, I want to do that and I'm going to be in Rio. And then when you go to Rio and you win a silver in the, in, in the Valdrome and then the gold, you get the gold and that back to your days of, of racing the flume trail and the, tech, the, the technical aspect of it. You've got there's three of you. So, you know, you're going to get a medal. But you, there's little mind games, and I bet you, you really like that, right? Because you, oh, yeah. you, you had a draw on your reservoir of racing to win that gold medal. Yeah. Well, so on the track, it was awesome because I made it to the gold medal round, which meant I could fall out of the starting gate and still get a medal. Right. I, I was going home with a silver. But a silver, so after I did win the silver because the British gal was better um, that day, um, I knew I still had two more opportunities. I didn't fare well in the TT. Right. And so my last hope was the road race. And the road race. Oh, my gosh. It, anything could happen. It was not my type of course. It was a lot flatter than I had been used to. And we couldn't break the field up. Like, we just Everybody couldn't. Stayed yeah, there. everyone just stayed together. And it was in the last, I want to say, maybe 5K. Finally, the gal from China, um, Germany, and myself did break away and then we and then I broke away from them but we still had two kilometers in a headwind straight flat to the finish line and so they ended up catching me and I knew they would so I just tucked in behind them and then it was figuring out when do I sprint like how do I beat these two gals who are super strong in a sprint which is you know I'm a climber You're 115 pounds <laughs> yeah, yeah I know what, what did you figure out when, I, when did you make your move I don't know well the German made her move at the 500 meter mark where she pulled alongside the Chinese gal. So I pulled to the other side. So all three of us were parallel. And then I just saw the sign that said 200 meters. And I figured that was my sign. And I attacked. And got it. And I got it er narrowly edged out. So uh, looking back at that little girl who always wanted to go to the Olympics, always wanted to be sitting at, standing on top of the podium, hearing her anthem with a gold medal wrapped around her neck. Now it's happened in your second athletic career. How special was that? Oh, it was incredible. I, I could never have dreamed that in a million years. And it was something that will never be taken away from me. <laughs> so fun. And obviously you've been part of CAF before when you were with Xterra, but being part of it, the, being inside it, uh, how uh, that relationship with UNCF, how cool has that been? Oh, it's been amazing. It, I mean, it's probably the thing that warms my heart the most because I remember dreaming as a little girl of being an athlete. And I can't imagine a child being born with a, dis a physical disability and not having that same dream because sport has been everything to me. It's, right. it's gotten me an education. It's taken me across the world. And I want everyone to have that same opportunity so if i can help pave that way and keep fighting for more inclusion with people with disabilities then you know then i needed to get this disability to be able to do that the other fun part of this and of course it wasn't fun at the time you thought you were you know everything was in the past but you were still getting sick Right, you were getting sick and getting sick, and you go into the hospital, and what'd you find out? <laughs> I found out I was pregnant with twins. 
<laughs> because you would go, oh, we need to do a what? A, we need to do a urine sample. Oh yeah, whatever. and I was like, no, you need to check my kidney because I had just had surgery to move my auto transplant my own kidney, and they were like, no, this is the ER, we follow protocol, and I was like, just give me a scan and. I caved in and peed in a cup. And when they told you you were <laughs> pregnant with twins, what were you? What were you, what were you oh my gosh, I was freaked out because I hadn't even been a year cancer free, and I thought, oh, what do I do? And and, it, I, and at first it was just finding out I was pregnant, and I was just like trying to wrap my brain around like, okay, so I'm pregnant, and then I go do an ultrasound and find out everything's okay. And by the way, you're having twins, and I straight freaked. <laughs> <laughs> and the twins were there. In Rio to watch they you were. win the gold. They were. They were so stoked. It was such an incredible moment to have my dad who had supported me all that time be there. And then my kids who were like the wonderful thing that came out of having cancer. Love it. Jamie, as always, so much fun to chat with you. Thank you for being up here in Boise. This is going to be a fun weekend. You excited? Yeah, I am. I love that um, Challenged Athletes has always been there to help people get back into sport or mm -hmm. participate in sport and now taking on the side of creating more um, racing for more us. More opportunities. Oh, more opportunities. Yeah. It's incredible and we need this and I'm so glad they're involved because they're you guys do everything top notch. What events will you be doing? I'm doing all three. I'm going to do the time trial, the crit, and the road race. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. j Doc. Jamie Whitmore has been our guest. You are the best. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> Thank you. Hold on, everybody. We will be right back.